never need each other more than when something terrible happens in the middle of nowhere. On July 20th, 1989, disaster struck on the edge of a Nevada highway miles from the nearest town, and a man's life was in the hands of whoever happened to pass by. Well, US 50 across this stretch is called the loneliest road in America. Sometimes you can drive 100 miles and, and maybe only see 10 vehicles. We have a lot of accidents on US 50 from people going to sleep, drifting off the side of the road, rolling over. At 8.30 p.m., a pickup truck with three people in it went off the road, rolled over once, and slammed into the base of a 45-foot power pole, completely shearing off the top of the pole. Neither Worthington and her husband were on their way to Reno. When they saw the smashed truck by the side of the road, they stopped to help. When I got there, there was no way that I knew that he had got bit with electricity. I was trying to check him over. He was thrashing around trying to get up. I really couldn't examine him very well because he was trying to get up, and I didn't want to get up under this wire. A passing motorist stopped to call 911. Hi, I'm calling to report an injury accident 25 miles east of Salad, Nevada on Highway 50. Okay, are they off the road or on the road? They're off the road. Uh, pickup truck. It was a rollover, hit a telephone pole. David and Susan Baker and their four children were on vacation, heading to California from their home in Texas. We saw the truck, and we both thought it was abandoned. When we saw the man lying there, and we saw the other people trying to help him, David just stopped and asked, has anybody called? They assumed Greg Hunshaw had been hurt in the truck accident. I believe there are three people injured. Um, we did not stop to assess it. We turned right around and came back to get an ambulance. Okay. okay hold on, hold on for a minute. Local paramedics were dispatched immediately. Injury 1050. Highway 50 East. 25 East of Allen. Injury 1050. Ambulance requested. He didn't even stop to think. You know, we didn't really even talk about it. He just turned around and went on back to the scene. For David Baker, the choice was clear. I've always had a fear of coming upon an accident and find someone in an accident that's in real bad shape. Kurt Stahl was also driving by on US 50 when he saw the accident scene and stopped to see if he could help. He looked like he was in pretty bad shape. His nose was all mashed up. He was afraid. He was yelling, I don't want to die. Um, don't let me die. I need to lay down. I explained to him that he was laying down. He kept trying to get up. 1043, pick up truck, roll over. Possibly three injured. Not knowing exactly what was wrong with Greg, they tried to calm him so he wouldn't injure himself further while they waited for help to come. He pulled off onto the side of the road and you know, I asked him if he knew any first aid and if he could help us. And he said, yeah, I know first aid. Greg was trying to get up, he was fighting, and he was right under the wire, and I was afraid that he would get up and get it again. Dave Baker asked me how he was doing. I told him that his pulse was okay, his, you know, respirations were okay. David's family watched from the car. I was hoping that the ambulance would hurry up and get there, and David, maybe he can help this man, and maybe he couldn't, but uh, the children were worried. They were frightened. It, it scared them. You'll see them, somebody else injured. He said, is there anybody else? I said, yes, there's one in the truck. 
It, it happened so fast that I really didn't realize what had happened until he fell to the ground. You just watched someone you love be electrocuted and he may be dead. When we continue. When Dave Baker went to the aid of Greg Hunshar, he too was electrocuted by the high voltage power lines down in the accident. Dave needed immediate medical attention, but the people who had come to his aid had no idea when or if the professional rescue workers would arrive. Navy officer Harold Clark and his friends had overheard a call about an injury accident. As CPR instructor, Harold immediately focused his attention on David. When I came up to him, he wasn't breathing, and you could smell the burnt flesh. And the way he was laying, he wouldn't have started breathing on his own. His airway had to have been cleared. I went into open up his airway and gave him two breaths and he started breathing. I was so relieved when I heard that he was still breathing. I got a rush of fear and a rush of relief all in about the span of two minutes and it was uh, it was very frightening. Somebody said we gotta get this power turned off. I just took off to make the 911 call. Kurtz would be the third call for help. Once he came to, he just, he wanted to get away. We tried to just held him still, just keep him from hurting himself. At that point, he did not look like a badly burned victim. He looked like he had a cut in the top of his head. And um, from when I got down to his feet, I noticed that his socks were burned to his leg. An estimated 20,000 volts of electricity had passed down David's body. He said he can't see. He said, help me, I can't see, I can't see. We said things like, it's dark out here, David. That's why you can't see. It's dark out here, just calm down. And he would say, I can't stop, I can't stop. I'm going to crash. I believe he thought he was still in a car. The Nevada Highway Patrol arrived. The first official on the scene was Trooper Dan Luke. How you doing here? I heard the man screaming. He couldn't see, and he was having, uh, he was delirious. Uh, they couldn't make him understand anything. I was worried that he was going to die at that time. I'd never seen anybody like that before. From the nearest town of Fallon, Sheriff Bill Lowry headed to the scene. I cautioned the units while they were en route to be careful of electricity. I got a call from dispatch that had talked to a local electrician who had monitored on the scanner, and he said, be careful, because that electricity can jump about three feet out of that high voltage wires. Barbara Frank and her partner were the first paramedics to arrive. They're right here, they're coming, hear them? Oh. Just relax, just relax. Just relax. Just relax. As triage officer, Barbara took charge of the medical treatment at the scene. The first rule of triage is to always secure your scene for you and your personnel. And it wasn't a safe scene. We had a high tension line down that we had to cross back and forth under. That's not a good idea in any situation. But there's no way to stabilize that line and there was no other way to do it. You can't stand there with three hurt people looking at you, screaming for you to do something and say, I'm not crossing underneath that line until the line is no longer hot. Okay, what's our clearance on these wires? About 18 inches. What's 18 those wires? Inches. It had been a half an hour since David was electrocuted. No. 
I was crying. I remember crying, but it was so dry and windy out there that no tears would come. And that electricity has gone from this man's brain all the way out his feet. It can do a lot of internal damage, both neurologically, structurally, to the bones, to the tissue. You don't know how much it cooked in between those two points of when it entrance and exit. The downed lines were within a few feet of the ground. When you got too close to the tension line, you could feel it. After I crossed into that line a few times, I didn't want to go back and forth anymore after that. Once it dawned on me that what I was feeling and that humming that I was hearing in the air wasn't just in my mind, it was real. Anyone could have been killed, myself, my partner, any of the bystanders that we allowed onto the scene, anyone that got too near that line. The down power lines were still hot, carrying 34,500 volts of electricity when Sheriff Lowry got to the scene. Tell everybody. They continued to work under the lines until all the victims were stabilized and could be moved. Okay, good operation. For some reason, the electricity didn't interfere with the electrical impulses that go through the heart. Our main concern was, was he going to go into cardiac arrest again? Was he going to have a seizure from this? Rescue workers and volunteers broke with normal procedure and common sense to risk their lives for Greg and David. Just about the time we, we started to load him, he, he went into a real flashback type thing. He kept screaming, somebody grab the wheel, somebody grab the wheel, we're going to wreck. God, please help me, somebody help me. It's a spooky thing to watch something like that happen, to not know if they're alive or dead. I honestly thought Dave Baker was dead until the ambulance got there. It could have been one of us very easily. This call really showed what volunteering was all about, both volunteering from the bystanders' point of views and just about what teamwork all together was about. And it was a call everyone should be proud of, including those people who stopped and rendered aid. Two months later, David Baker is undergoing intensive physical therapy. The whole body works off electricity, and because of it being short-circuited, basically, it's been disconnected. Your muscles and everything have to learn where they belong and how to react. It's like a baby learning to roll over, how to move if you want the arm to go up, what you have to do to make it go up. And it's really painful at first and hard. I like just roll over would cause me to break out into a sweat. Switch legs up on I'll be in the hospital for quite a while. Probably about six more months or so. Soon he should, in a week, two, three weeks, he may be able to walk on crutches. I don't know. But I just asked that um, he would help my dad get better as soon as possible and that he might not die. Mentally, he's great. Physically, we don't know how much nervous system damage there is. I never would ever think that this would happen to me or my family. It's just, it's been uh, sort of unreal. You feel like you're just going through the motions, you know, you're just, it's not really happening to you. You just, you just don't want to really think that it's happening to you. It's hard to describe. Greg Unshaw received skin grafts where he was burned by the electricity, but has otherwise recovered. I was next to David for a few days, and him and I were together. He was in definite pain, I was in definite pain. We didn't talk to each other much. I think everybody that helped, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. But David especially, because he, he, he's going through what I'm going through. He, he, he feels what I feel. David's doctors expect that he'll be able to lead a normal life, but he may never be the same as he was before risking his life to help a stranger. The man who gave David artificial respiration under the wires understands the choice he made. I think he did what he thought he had to do. Each man feels different things inside. Some people say, well, it's their problem. Let them handle it. Some people don't feel that way. I would hope that if I've, I'm ever in the predicament where I need help, somebody would come and help me. To me, when I see somebody that's hurt and needs help, I have just was raised that you just can't turn them down, really, no matter what the cost and why. And even if it puts yourself in a little bit of a danger, that you've got to put forth the effort.
to save someone. There's a lot. Yeah, he really is. He really is. Next, 